Crimes from the Peanut Gallery, my fellow peanuts, and anyone new to the podcast or to the channel, welcome. So this podcast covers true crime cases that may not be suitable for young listeners. There may be graphic or violent content. Listener discretion is advised. So guys, before I start my podcast today, I just want to point out to anyone who's actually watching on video, there is something slightly different today. Last week, I had a Snoopy pop head here. This week, I've got a Care Bears, Cheer Bear specifically. So every episode, I'm going to change it up and be putting something different. Now, whether it be in the background here, whether it be here, whether it be me myself on something that I'm wearing, what I want you guys to do is actually comment down below what you think is different in the episode. It's going to start with the bonus episode in Halloween and whoever gets the correct answer and answers first gets a prize. Now, to my listeners that aren't watching on a video, I'm going to be putting up a quiz on my podcast. I want you guys to comment and whoever comments correctly first will be also getting a prize. So this episode is going to be about South Carolina. So anyone who is from South Carolina, welcome and hello. Now I do seem to have a bit of a thing for the name Henry because today we're going to be talking about Donald Henry Gaskins. Now he had a nickname of Pee Wee. So if occasionally I drop in Pee Wee, this is who I'm referring to. Now he was called this because of his small frame. So he weighed about 50 to 55 kilos, which I believe is about 120 pounds. And he was 5'3". So that's about 150 to 155 centimeters. Now, this has me wondering if he's got short man syndrome and this possibly led to some of the murders. He was also known as the redneck Charles Manson. Now, before I even start this podcast, I do want to say that Donald was one of the most sadistic killers I've ever read about or listened to anything about. But in saying that, though, his childhood, it was beyond horrendous. Now, I can see how he would also be known as one of the most prophylic serial killers in South Carolina's history. Now, Donald was born on March 13th, 1933, in Florence County, South Carolina, to Yalea Parrott and a man only known as Mr. Gaskins. Now, he was also known as a neighbor who was very, who was very wealthy and right near the Parrott family. Now, his mum actually had a really awful childhood herself. She was forced to quit school at the age of 12 to get a job, which ended up being picking cotton and planting tobacco. This was not unheard of during the times where she was alive. So unfortunately for her, she didn't have any school experience or any education. Now, at the age of 14, though I'm not sure whether this was her choice or not, she actually decided to sell her body. Now, Mr. Gaskins, that neighbor, would pay her a dollar per week to just do that, sell her body, as he liked little girls. Now, something's clearly wrong with Mr. Gaskins in this place, given that she was barely even a teenager. So around this time, she became pregnant. Now, he would end up giving her a small three-bedroom shack on his property, and he would end up increasing her pay to $10 a month. Now, although they'd never be a real couple, his mum and dad would continue their sexual relationship even after he was born. Now, it was claimed that they had sex in front of him, and he would actually try and stop them. Now, this could also explain some of his twisted thoughts on sex later in his life or some of the violence that he incurred on people because this was his experience. Now, Yalea would prove to be an incredibly unfit mum from things such as having clients because she did continue to actually sell her body even whilst having a relationship with Mr. Gaskins. Now, this was to bring in extra money, but what would happen is these clients would physically and sexually assault her son. All she would do was just watch. This abuse would continue through most of his childhood. Now, when he was not even a year old, he drank a bottle of kerosene. Now, this would cause seizures and convulsions until he was at least the age of three. Now, his mother did provide little to no supervision and protection from this abuse, which I think would ultimately lead to him hating women at a really young age, or at least I wonder. I would also think that swallowing the kerosene would have some type of effect on his mental capacity or even his mental instability. Though I can only imagine that all of the suffering that he endured in his most formative years would lead him to take it out on others later in his life. His next paternal figure would unfortunately be his stepfather, 
They married when he was about 10 years old. He would be a field hand, but he would continue this massive cycle of abuse. During the marriage, his mum would end up having two more sons and two daughters who would also be abused by their stepfather. Now, school provided to be just as bad as his home life. He was teased and he was beaten by his schoolmates, just mainly due to being smaller than everybody else. And I think they saw the bruises from the abuse at home. So he was a really easy target. I'm not saying that that is any reason for people to do that. I'm just trying to give some insight. Now, when he finally did have the courage to tell his teachers, their response is absolutely the most abysmal response that I could think of and makes no sense to me whatsoever. They beat him as well as they saw Donald as the problem for not getting along well with the other kids. It really seems to me that the world just didn't give Donald much of a chance. A lot of the odds were against him and all of this before the age of 12. Now, this treatment though didn't stop him from becoming one of the most cruel and heinous killers I've ever read about. Now, this next bit, it's not clear whether he quit school at 8 or 12 Nothing's been registered anywhere. Not that it really matters, but he also wouldn't have an education. So he'd not go back to school, but he would soon start a career as a criminal. And so at around the age of 12, he would start working at a garage and he found that he was really good at fixing things. He really seemed to find his niche and something he genuinely loved. And he actually could see a future in this. Now, It wouldn't last though, because despite all of this and making a really good wage, his stepfather would ultimately force him to quit and go and work in the fields. But he did find ways to sneak back and keep up with those skills in that garage. So, and he was also able to make a little bit of extra money on the side for himself. Whilst he was working at this garage, he met and he became friends with Danny Smith and Henry Marsh. Now, they named themselves the Trouble Trio. This trio would prove to be way more than trouble. They would prove to be downright sick when they got together. It's just perverse, some of the things they end up doing together. Now, after Donald found a little shack in the woods, he bought his two new little friends. He bought his two new little friends there and they gave it the hideout. Now, this would provide a safe place for all of them. And at the age of 13, they would start doing some petty crimes such as stealing candy and cigarettes from vending machines, which they'd then take back to the hideout. Now, I think, now this is me just making an assumption. I think all of them had not such great childhood homes. So this hideout would prove to be a real safe haven for them. And I'm guessing just a really safe space. Later that year, they'd be caught, they would be caught peeping at girls in the local church's outhouse. They were given severe beatings by their parents. But Donald would actually remark, which still astounds me, he was more upset about getting caught than the actual beating or what they'd done. Now, a couple of years later, when the boys were about 15, they began breaking into houses with one of the boys' dad's help. Deadbeat dad, for some reason, comes to mind. So they would sell whatever they stole. With the money that they made from their stealing and their robberies, the boys were able to actually buy a car. Now, they would drive to Fort Jackson or Columbia or to whatever was nearby to use prostitutes. They would soon get sick of using prostitutes, though, and they wanted someone innocent. They wanted to sleep with a virgin. And this is the one of the most horrendous things I've ever read. They had decided that they would rape Henry's 13-year-old sister, Julie, And I don't really think that I'm comfortable discussing the things that they did to her. So I'm sorry, I won't be giving that any airtime. But what I can say is, it was a gang rape. Julie was brave enough to tell her mum what had been done to her. And so her mum informed the other parents. Again, the boys were beaten severely. But in my opinion, and in my mind, those parents should have gone to the police and dealt with it the legal way. But that didn't happen. And I don't know if that's because they decided to keep it in the family. They didn't want outsiders knowing exactly what their boys had done. But really, for me, I would want the police to be dealing with this situation. 
So soon after this incident, though, Danny and Henry's families moved away. So it would leave Donald to be by himself again. This incredible act of violence, though, was described by Donald as being a very fulfilling part of his life. I really have to say he's an incredibly fair individual. Donald committed another act um, of violence at the age of 16 this time. Now, he was robbing a house with another one of his delinquent mates, Walt. When a young girl came upon the robbery, she happened to be the owner's daughter. Now, she attacked Donald with a hatchet, but unfortunately for her, Donald was able to get it away from her and he beat her head and arms with it. Now, thankfully, she lived and Walt managed to get away. No charges, no police involvement, but Donald himself was charged with assault, with a deadly weapon and intent to kill. During his sentence, Donald actually learned of his real name. He'd always been called Peewee at home. So he didn't even know that his name was Donald Henry Gaskins. I still find this incredibly bizarre. I just, yeah, just astonishes me. Now, he was sent to South Carolina Industrial School for Boys until he was 18. His time at the reform school, it was pretty darn appalling, I've got to say. His first night, he was approached by one of the boss boys. So these guys were the leaders, leaders, the biggest and the meanest of the school. Now, in very basic terms, they ran the school while the guards went around. Now, he was, told by this, he was told by this boy that Donald would be his sweetheart. Donald didn't want any part of that, so he blatantly refused. And I hate to even say this out loud, but later that night, he was gang raped by 20 or so of boss, boss Boy's friends and Boss Boy for his refusal to obey. His first year was really, really rough. He was the Boss Boy's sweetheart, and at times he'd be sold and told to give sexual favours to other boys in exchange for cigarettes or whatever else the boss boy needed. Now, almost a year after all of this torture began, Donald and four other boys who were treated very similar to him would escape. Now, he managed to get to his old old hideout for two days before being found. Now, as a returning gift, the guards punished him with lashings for 30 days and three months of hard labour and solitary confinement. Now, there would be an upside to the solitary confinement, though. No more being the sweetheart of the boss boy, so no rapes. When his three months were up, though, it started all over again. Rapes continued from the boss boy and his mates this time. And one time, just for their own sadistic pleasure, they'd make Donald run around in girls' underwear. Now, he would ultimately escape again, but this time he'd go to his aunt's house where he actually found a real mum figure and he managed to stay out of trouble. Now, he'd help around the house for his aunt doing odd jobs. He'd do chores like he was told and it just felt like he'd found his place with his aunt. He found like he'd had a real mum figure. He had a safe space. His aunt ultimately did convince him to turn himself in and not to spend the rest of his life in hiding or be a fugitive. Now, when he turned himself back into the reform school, his punishment would once again be hard labour and solitary confinement. But this time, the guards seemed to have a real chip on their shoulder. You know, twice he's managed to escape. So they'd find reasons to lash and beat on Donald. But one day in particular, I think Donald had had enough because when the guards found a reason to beat him again, he ended up punching one of the guards in the face and the balls. Now, they would send him to the mental hospital for an evaluation, but no evaluation ended up happening because he didn't stay any longer than than a day before his appendix ruptured. So he was sent to a hospital outside of the reform school. A little bit of a, you know, (laughs) relief for him, I imagine, having a little bit of time out from from everything. Now, after being treated for his ruptured appendix, he was sent back to the reform school, but he what they were told that he could only perform light duties for three months but shortly after those three months had finished the guards wanted revenge desperately absolutely desperately they beat him and when he was out of solitary confinement the boss boy continued having him as a sweetheart he needed to escape again which he did but he managed to find a job this time with the traveling carnival and he'd meet a 13 year old girl and he would marry her her name is mary now He didn't want Mary to live a life on the run, so he ended up turning himself back into the reform school. But he would finish out his sentence 
But the last two years in that reform school would most definitely leave Donald with emotional scars and damage him beyond belief. Look, it would harden absolutely anyone. But given his childhood on top of that, he would honestly become a real life monster. Now, he had a lot of reasons to become that monster, and I can absolutely understand that. But the things that he ended up doing was done to him. So I really, I don't understand it, right? Like for me, it's why would you want to cause that amount of pain that you went through onto other people? It seriously doesn't make any sense to me. Now, he was 18 and he was out of reform school and he'd end up getting a construction job for a really brief period of time. And once Mary was pregnant, they decided to live with Mary's family in Georgetown, South Carolina. Now, one of his mates from reform school, Slick, would come and visit him a few months after they'd moved to Georgetown. Now, he offered him work on his tobacco farm, a three-bedroom house and a pickup truck. And this was all in Jacksonville, South Carolina. It was really an offer too good to be true. And it would prove to be exactly that. Now, Slick and Donald, they ended up being quite disgruntled over the workload and the pay. So this led to a plan to burn down barns for the tobacco farmers for a price. Now, people certainly suspected Pee Wee, but they couldn't prove it. And in 1952, his daughter Shirley was born. But shortly after that, Slick was arrested for all of those arsons. However, the new owners of the tobacco farm allowed Donald and his family to, dis- to stay despite the links to Slick. Now, this is where it all gets a bit interesting. The new owner's daughter of the plantation didn't like Donald at all, and she suspected him that he'd helped Slick burn down those barns. And when she decided to confront him, it turned ugly so quickly. He resorted, though, to the only thing that he knew, violence. He ended up hitting her with a hammer, splitting her head open and knocking her unconscious. Now, Donald was terrified of being arrested again, and he fled. Now, he was found a couple of days later, so he was charged this time as an adult with assault with a deadly weapon with intent to kill and arson. Now, this was in relation to the burning of those barns, so they must have found some evidence in order to also charge him with those with arson as well. Now, he was originally sentenced to five years, but he decided to call the judge a son of a bitch in a moment of anger. Now, that earned him an additional year. He's lucky he didn't get more for calling, it, calling out a judge like that. In 1953, his prison experience was fairly similar to reform school, though. This would be where he would commit his first murder in this particular prison sentence. Now, his new owner was named Arthur, but Arthur was what they call a power man. Now, they're basically boss boys, but they're considered far more dangerous and far more brutal. So for six months, he was raped by Arthur, but he was already becoming a smarter criminal and he was learning about prison dynamics. He knew he had to kill a power man to become one himself, but rather than going after Arthur, he went straight to the top. So there was a top power man by the name of Hazel Brazen, and he would befriend Hazel and he would earn his trust and become his friends. But when the time come, he would slit his throat and kill him. Now, this would be where Donald's height and stature would be used to his advantage because he managed to convince those guards that it was self-defence due to his size and he was believed. So he was only required to serve a couple of months in solitary confinement. Now, I would have thought given that you're in prison and you're manslaughter or whatever it is, you would definitely get more years. But I'm guessing because the self-defense I'm guessing he he wasn't charged at all so but I don't know enough about that kind of stuff but I just thought "Mm, that's really interesting to me but once he'd served his couple of months in solitary he found himself a power man himself and he was actually given his own inmate to rape and beat but given his experience he he said himself that he always went easy on them in 1955 Mary would file for divorce He didn't really like this and he wanted to save the marriage. But given what he did after he escaped, it doesn't really seem like he cared that much to me. I think he just needed an excuse to really escape jail. Now, he couldn't seem to to find Mary, so he moved on 
and he went to visit a friend from the carnival. Now, Poss was in Florida, but before he moved to Florida, but before he got to Florida, he stole his cousin's car, David, to a 1950 blue Pontiac. Remember that name, David? Donald decided that the best way to avoid detection was to travel with Poss in the carnival. Whilst on the road, though, he met Junie Alice Holden, whom he married for all of two weeks, though I'm not sure it was a real marriage because I didn't think you could marry when you're already married to someone else. But I could be wrong. I, yeah. He promptly left her, though, two weeks later, and she was never to hear from him ever again. Her blessings, in hindsight, her blessings. Now, he went back to that carnival and he became involved with a woman named Betty Gates. This would prove to be the worst idea on the planet as he'd end up back in jail because of it. She asked him to drive her to Tennessee to see her brother, who just happened to be in jail and needed to be bailed out. Now, he absolutely adored Betty and would do anything for her. So when she asked him to deliver a carton of cigarettes to her brother while he was in jail, he most certainly did. However, when he returned to the motel that he'd rented with Betty, she was gone and so was the car. That silly boy decided to stay just in case she came back, proving to be the second stupid thing for him to do. First believing Betty even remotely wanted to be with him or liked him. The next morning, he was woken by police as one of those packs of cigarettes he gave Betty's brother had a razor blade in it and he used it to escape. So he was now an accomplice. But the joke was on Donald because he found out that it wasn't Betty's brother at all. It was, in fact, her husband. So initially, he tried to say that he was actually David Gaskins, that cousin that he'd stolen the Pontiac from and that Betty had stolen that car. This had definitely proved to be really futile, though, as it really didn't take that long for the police to discover that he was a fugitive. Now, when he arrived back in prison, other powermen and the prisoners questioned whether he was still a power man. Stupid move by those people, I might add. So in retaliation to this, he stole a knife from the kitchen and he cut off another prisoner's ears. They no longer questioned it, and he went back to being a power man in prison. Now, due to the fact that he'd stolen a car and took it across state lines, he was charged by the FBI because it would be considered a federal crime. So he had to serve another three years in a federal prison. Though this really wasn't a bad experience for Donald for the first time, because while he was in the federal prison in Atlanta, he became friends with a person named Frank Costello. Now, Frank Costello happened to be the godfather of the Genovese family. (laughs) Frank would give him a nickname, Little Hatchet Man, and he actually protected him. So because of this friendship and the protection, Pee-wee's experience proved to be far less complicated this time around and no more assaults. In 1961, at the ripe age of 28, he was finally released from prison and a free man. He'd returned to Florence, South Carolina, but due to his ongoing issues with his stepfather, he would end up actually moving in with his cousin, Marvin Parrott. Now, no one really wants to hire a convicted felon, right? So he did really struggle to find work during this time, but he was able to eventually find a car, find a job repainting cars. He would marry for a third time in 1962 to an 18-year-old by the name of Jerry. But he'd soon return to this life of crime. He'd be robbing, he'd be stealing, but it was never quite enough to ever actually make a living. In September of this this same year, he would molest a 12-year-old girl by the name of Patsy. And the only reason he even knew of her was because she happened to live near his mother. Now, he was quickly identified as the assailant and he was promptly charged with knowledge of a child. This would actually become this, sorry, this would actually later become what we know as statutory rape. Now, while at the courthouse, a deputy removed Donald's handcuffs and he managed to escape by jumping 30 feet out of a window. He clearly had no desire to go back to jail. So he escaped 
in a stolen county car, which just happened to have keys in the ignition. Now he'd stop by his mum's to grab some money, ditch the car and make his way to Dillon. Now, once he arrived in Dillon, he'd steal a 1962 Ford Galaxy and drive across state lines again into North Carolina. He'd meet his fourth wife. Seriously, how do these women keep falling for him, by the way? Now, her name was Lenny Oxendine, and she happened to be at the Lumbee Indian Reservation in Pembroke. Now, he would grow bored with her after about three months and ditch her. He told her he was going to the store and he just never came back. I, I don't even know what to say to that. He would actually make some comments about this marriage in particular, though. It was, it weren't that I stopped loving her. It were the edginess and the bothersomeness stirring around inside me. I got so edgy and mad at the world. I just had to get away. Also, remember the term bothersomeness. This is going to come up again. Okay? Now, I'm just going to give a bit of my own opinion here. Given his childhood, reform school, prison time, and failed marriages, it really doesn't strike me as odd that he's going to be mad at the world. And it also sounds like he's got a bit of a mental illness. What's this bothersome feeling? What is going on with this? And I do wonder if the prison system had taken the time to do some tests, some evaluations, whether he would have stood a chance in this world. Given that he went to the mental hospital in reform school and prison do have those type of tests available, but maybe not during that time. Maybe they didn't capture all of that mental health, but that's just my thoughts anyway. Now, he would briefly reunite with his third wife, Jerry, after leaving Lenny. Now, she was still quite upset about the little girl, Patsy, and rightly so, because he'd molested a 12-year-old girl. But somehow in all of this, he was able to sweet talk his way back into her life. God knows how, guys. God knows how. They'd drive down to Florida to see Post and see if they could get any work at the carnival. Unfortunately, Post had just committed suicide after the recent death of his wife and four children. Now, rather than being sad over the death of his friend, he was actually sad over the fact that he couldn't get work. Again, a despicable human being. Now, Jerry, unfortunately, she really didn't want to live a life on the run, so she wanted to go home to South Carolina. And this is where he would agree to actually drive her back. However, once they crossed the border into Georgia, Donald heard those police sirens. Now, he tried to get away, but the left front tire blew out and the car had spun into a marsh. He once again proved to be a despicable human being because he left his third wife to drown. Now, thankfully, she did survive this and she was picked up by the police, but no charges were brought against her. Now, the police made a bit of a boo-boo here. They made the presumption that Donald had possibly drowned. So once the police had left the area, Donald fled back to North Carolina, back to his fourth wife, Lenny. Now, she didn't want any part of him and wanted him out of her life as soon as possible. Now, she would soon read about the incident with Jerry and her almost drowning, and she would end up contacting the police. Now, he'd find himself back in handcuffs pretty quickly and extradited back to Florence, South Carolina to face those charges. Now, it was almost two years he'd been on the run. Donald was now set to serve time for what he'd done to Patsy, so he was sentenced to six years and an extra two years for his escape. Now, when he arrived back at prison, he was still considered a power man. However, there was a slight difference. That, there was a slight difference this time. He had a warden that truly believed in rehabilitation and not using extreme punishment on prisoners. Now, Willis McDougall or McDougald, the warden of the prison, would even write a letter to the parole board asking for Donald's release due to his good behaviour. Wouldn't this prove to be the worst mistake in history? And this letter obviously went a really long way because he was released after only serving four years of his eight-year sentence. There was one condition of his parole though, 
he was never to set foot in Florence. He paid no attention to, to this though, guys. He'd return on many occasions, time for family barbecues, and he'd also go and see his daughter, 17. Now, she happened to be married and had children of her own. Once again free, he would stay out of, tru- he would stay out of trouble for the most part, but he would commit robberies here and there, but nothing as serious as what was about to happen. The worst was yet to come. Now, before ending this episode, I will take us through a timeline of the confirmed murders. They aren't necessarily ones he was convicted of. There are others, but the ones I'm about to discuss are where the bodies have been found and identified. Ten of these he was convicted and charged with. There are 14 victims in total. On the next episode, I'm going to be discussing murders of hitchhikers. However, these bodies have not been found, so I can't confirm them. Now, on the screen, you're going to see a timeline. This is to show you how the murders went down. So the first row is going to be 1970 to 1974. The next row is 1975. And the row below is his jailhouse murder. Now, a thank you to my wonderful BFF Claire for the awesome suggestion. 1970 was Janice Kirby and Patricia Aldbrook. Janice Kirby happened to be his niece. 1971 or 72, it's not confirmed. There was a Martha Dix. She was also known as Clyde. In 1973, it was Doreen Dempsey and her two-year-old daughter, Robin Dempsey. In 1974, Johnny Sellers and Jesse Judy. 1975, the worst year yet. Silas Yates, Diane Neely, Avery Howard, Kim Gelkins, Dennis Bellamy, and John Knight. And in 1981, Rudolf Tyner. Now, before I go, next episode, we will be discussing the murders, which are very, very brutal. And I want to give everyone a warning. And this will be a trigger warning for anything to do with sexual assault, because there is quite a mention of it. Now, If you like this podcast, please hit the subscribe button or whatever platform you're using. Please hit a like. Please comment if you think there's anything more I can be doing. If you have any feedback, feel free to leave those comments. Now, have a great night, my fellow peanut true crime buffs. Thank you.